Well, during college, this may surprise you, but during college, I worked as a bank teller. And it was my least favorite job I've ever had. I'm not a math guy, and that's why I'm in ministry, or one of the many reasons, I guess you could say. A few months after I had quit, uh, I had a summons to court to testify in court. I had accepted a forged check, and I was to testify against the guys, the guy who forged the check. It was a fake check. The check amount was whited out, and a new amount was put in that did not reflect the original amount. I didn't catch it. Hey, it looked good to me. Like I said, this wasn't my dream job, nor was it my calling. Well, thankfully, I didn't have to testify. He skipped bail, jumped bail, and I'm not sure what happened to him, but thankfully, I didn't have to go into court, a court of law, and swear to testimony that, yes, I'm the guy who accepted his false, che- false check. Well, likewise, many religions look good on the surface if you're not paying attention. Even some versions, I'll say it that way, of Christianity. We need discernment to be able to understand, though something may have the appearance of greatness, is in fact fake, counterfeit, or false. There's two ways that a religion can be fake. And what I mean by religion... Religion, as Webster's defines it, and that is a set of beliefs or practices surrounding the worship of something or someone. We believe this book. We have the true religion. God has revealed himself to us. Now, that's not popular, and that may offend some of you, but this is what we believe this book to be. We are the true religion. There's many false ones out there. There's two ways that a religion can be false. One, that in and of itself, it's a false religion. There's a false God and a false system of belief. That's one way. There's a second way. You can have the right religion, but then those who are in it begin to twist it and change it into something other than the truth. And that the second one is what we want to look at today because Jesus addresses that type of religion, a true religion that's been twisted. Judaism was the true religion, the religion of the one true God. And as it's becoming Christianity with Christ, bringing in the new covenant from the old covenant, Jesus addresses the Pharisees and the Sadducees who had taken God's true religion and twisted it and turned it into something other than it was meant to be. And he calls those Pharisees and Sadducees out for such a diabolical scheme. How can we prevent and discern against the fake checks, if you will, of false religion? Is there a remedy? Well, of course, the answer is yes. This is titled a remedy for false religion. And we find that through Jesus, of course. Jesus is continuing his journey to the cross, and along the way, he is mapping out for us what it means to truly follow him and to have the true religion of him. And in that, it's taking up our cross and following him. And in Matthew 20, we looked at last week, Jesus, in his training, helped us understand what true greatness truly is. He had to help the disciples unlearn false greatness. He called them to reject entitlement. He told them to embrace the unavoidable, the unavoidable being suffering for the name of Christ. You can't get around it. He called them to avoid the obvious, the obvious being the way the world sees greatness, and rather to pursue the right status, which is servant and slave, and to follow the right example, which was he himself. Matthew 23 continues that theme of greatness, teaching his disciples what what greatness truly is by exposing the fake greatness of false religion. Quite simply, Our main point today in looking at this passage in Matthew 23 is this. The cross-taking life is a sure remedy for false religion. You see, false religion exploits power. It's hollow. It's deceptive. It diminishes suffering. It sees glory in self-accomplishment and self-righteousness. True religion is faith in Jesus Christ. Given by God's grace to save us from our sins. He alone is our salvation. And when he, as we trust in him and have faith in him, makes us born again to new life. In that new life, we take our cross. We deny self. It's essential to us as disciples. We take up our cross daily. It is costly. It is total. It is a great gain because we receive Christ in it. 
And that path is the path to true greatness. So we find ourselves here in Matthew chapter 23. Just to give a little background of what was taking place between Matthew 20 and 23, Jesus continued to preach through parables. He has an encounter in chapter 22 with the Pharisees. They plotted to entangle Jesus in his words. They failed. The Sadducees tried the same. They failed. Jesus reminds them of the greatest commandment, to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, strength, and to love their neighbor as themselves. Jesus stumped them, and they ended up asking no more questions. They were furious. They wanted him dead, and they eventually achieved that at least for three days. Jesus here in chapter 23, in these verses that we look at, brings the Pharisees and the Sadducees to trial. And in that, he exposes their sin. And in doing so, it's like opening up the lid of a garbage bin and the stench of their sin emanating out, coming out. And they did not like it. Like I said, they wanted him and plotted his death because of this. So as is what we do here, we stand in honor of God's word. So would you stand as I read to you a portion of the section we're going to look at today in Matthew 23, starting in verse 1. If you got one of the free Bibles, it's page 918. I'd love for you to turn there and follow along. This is, this is what happens. Verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe what they tell you, but not the works that they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. And they love the place of honor at the feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi. Let's end there, but we'll see this whole section in just a bit. You may be seated and may God bless his word to us as we unpack what this is telling us today. In fact, what we see here are four symptoms of false religion. It's not an exhaustive list. But rather, it does get to the core of false religion. And you can trace all four of these to false religion and more. The first one is this. We see a hollow holiness. This is the first symptom. A hollow holiness. Verses 1 through 3. Jesus, after these interactions with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, now turns to the crowd, the disciples and the crowd. And he calls out these Pharisees and and scribes. Sadducees. The scribes were the learned men of Scripture. The Pharisees were the religious leaders. And he says they sit in Moses' seat. That was a metaphor. Moses had been given the law of God. And he wrote the first five books of the Bible, which can also be referred to as the Torah. They were to be the the interpreters and teachers of the Torah. This was a, a very important position in the worship life of the Jews. And they had failed at it. And this is what stokes Jesus' rebuke against them. In fact, this is the harshest rebuke against anybody during the time of Jesus on planet Earth. This chapter, he unloads on them and what he thinks about what they've done to the true religion of following God. Now, in that, though, you may be shocked at what he says in verse 3. He says, they sit in Moses' seat, verse 2, and he says, so do and observe what they tell you. Wait a minute. These are the bad guys. Why are we supposed to, to do and observe whatever they tell you? Well, as far as being in Moses' seat, they have the true word of God. They have the true law, and they are teaching that and proclaiming that. And he says, as far as they do that, obey what they say. And that tells us something important here. The truth is the truth, no matter who says it. The truth of God's word. And so what that means then is hypocrisy is not a get out of jail free card. And what I mean by that is this. Some of you, maybe some of you are here today, say, I don't believe in God. I'm not going to follow Christ because all of his followers are hypocrites. Well, guess what? There's room for one more, as it's been said. So come and join us. Be a part of that. Here's the reality, though. There are some who claim to be Christian who aren't. And so they may claim to be a Christian, but they don't walk in Christ's ways. Even the best of us fail at it. 
None of us are perfect. We need a Savior. We know that. That's why we're here. We're those who recognize that we fail in that. But there are those who use hypocrisy against following, or at least as a reason why they wouldn't follow. But imagine that one day that you face Christ and you're reckoning with him and you say, you know what, Jesus, I I wanted to follow you, but all those hypocrites kept me away. That's not going to get you a free pass. The truth is the truth and you need to believe it, even with the failure of Christians. Now, those of you who are hypocrites, you're not off the hook. Jesus unloads on hypocrisy. Why? Because it deters people from following him. That's not an excuse, but it definitely is something in the real world that causes people to fall away and to not follow. I've had two pastors that I've served under. There was a man also who preached at a summer camp, and he preached the word of God, and he preached the gospel, and it changed my life. That truth hasn't changed. All three of those men have fallen away, had huge impacts in my spiritual life with the truth of God's word, but all three of them were hypocrites and walked away from the faith, or not maybe walked away, but lived a double life. Devastating, and yet the truth remains. I don't get to say then because of their failure, I don't believe it anymore. It's still true, and it's truly affected my life. But for those who are hypocrites, Christ calls that out. He says, so do and observe what they tell you, but not the works they do, for they preach, but do not practice. They don't practice what they preach. Don't follow them with that. That's not the right way. In fact, hypocrisy is now a synonym, or a Pharisee is now a synonym of hypocrisy. You may not even know what a Pharisee was before you walked in. Didn't know it was a religious leader in Judaism 2,000 years ago. But you know when someone says you're a Pharisee, that means hypocrite. That's their legacy. Look at what Jesus says about them in in the second half of this, the seven woes that he gives starting in verse 13 all the way to verse 36. He unloads a message for them and their hypocrisy. And look at what he says starting uh, in verse 25. He says these words, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate. He's not talking about their dinnerware. He's talking about their lives. But inside, they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, then the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. These were the teachers of the law, and inside they were lawless. This did not go well. Here's the truth. They were unredeemed. They're to be the the teachers of the law, and they did that. So listen to the law, but don't follow their example. Because these are unsaved men. They're incapable of fulfilling God's law. The law was never meant for us something to do to earn salvation. Rather, the law reveals to us that we need a Savior. And that God has provided one in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. That's the hope that we have. They can't do the law unless the Spirit Unless God has gotten a hold of them. No, their holiness is like those chocolate bunnies at Easter. You you get excited about it as a kid. It's huge. And you bite into it. It's the thinnest layer of chocolate you've ever tasted. Tastes like wax. And there's nothing inside. That's what they are. In fact, it's worse than that. We can kind of laugh at that a little bit. But it's worse because Jesus called them a whitewashed tomb. Oh, that headstone looks beautiful, engraved in the finest marble or granite. But on the inside, it's just dead stench of death. That's severe. That was insulting to the highest level. You see, the clearest light is nothing to the blind. And they are blind. They are dead in their sins and cannot see the truth. Hey, the outward appearance may fool others. It might even fool yourself, but it does not fill, fool God in any way. It's hollow. Let me ask you, are you real or are you pretending? You can fool your wife. You can fool your husband. You can fool your kids. Maybe. You can maybe fool us. 
But you can't fool God. You can't fool Jesus. That's the first, hollow holiness. The second is a lazy legalism. Verse 4, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay on Lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. What are these heavy burdens? Are we talking about packages here? No, that's the metaphor of adding to the law. There was the law that they were supposed to teach, but then they've added to the law. Over the last 400 years <clears throat> in this story, there were the called the silent years. There were no prophets. There were, no, there were none who spoke on behalf of God. <clears throat> all they had was the Old Testament. And so along the line, the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes and all of this evolved into adding things onto the law. As if the law wasn't enough, they added to it. Now, in some ways, they were maybe trying to be helpful and detail some things out. But ultimately, what it began, what it happened was just creating heavy burdens on people's back. This did not go well with Jesus either. In Matthew 15, he tells them, he says, this people, these religious leaders, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Paul warned Titus of those infiltrating his church. They're devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. They added to the law as if that was helpful. Instead, here's God's true law, which is to drive us to our need of salvation. Instead, they heap on it heavy burdens. Let me give you a couple of examples of some of those really outrageous types of things. One of them was on the Sabbath, which was meant by God as a gift of grace to rest on that day. You work hard six days, rest on the Sabbath was to his people. Instead, you needed to be careful. If you spit on the ground and it hit the dirt, you were guilty of work because that was tilling the ground like a farmer. That's how they designated that. So you can't spit on the dirt. But it was okay to spit on a rock because that's not ground that you would till on. That's bizarre. And yet that was one of the, you see how these, they begin to add up. They're burden. Man, I, you know, it's the Sabbath. I, where do I spit? What do I do? Not only that, but on the Sabbath, they designate you can't light a candle. But you could hire a Gentile to come to your house to light a candle for you on the Sabbath. That's how bizarre some of this was getting. You couldn't travel on the Sabbath because that would be a work. And so you were allowed to, and I don't know where they came up with this number, a thousand yards. So you could go a thousand yards from your house. Well, sometimes that wasn't far enough to where you needed to go. So what you could do, they added on to it where you could take a rope and get 400 more yards out of it. You take that rope, you go to another house, and then that house would be connected to your house. So then you could go 1,400 yards instead of just a thousand. This is how bizarre it was getting. And all this did was heap heavy burdens. This is legalism. Adding to God's law. Here, here are three ways that we can see and perceive legalism. One, it could be as simple as taking God's true law and thinking that you can earn your way to salvation. Hey, nine out of ten commandments, that's a 90%. That's an A minus. That's good, right? In God's economy, no. What about 80? What about eight out of ten? What about seven out of ten? That's a passing grade, right? No. It says if you, if you break one of God's commandments, you've, the, you've broken them all. You are in utter need of a Savior. That's, that's one way of taking the actual law of God and trying to think that you can earn his salvation, earn his favor. A second way would be <clears throat> there are areas in the Scripture that, they, that aren't covered, and so we develop convictions about them. But then it be, can become legalism when we expect others to follow our convictions about that. You have a way in which you do things and you expect someone else is to do that. Ah, my water boy is here. Thank you. <laughs> a true humble servant modeling for us today what's happening. So thank you, David. I appreciate that. And so what you have here is the second idea where your convictions, then you expect others or you look down at them. Well, they're not as holy as me because they see movies that I don't see. They listen to music that I don't listen to. 
And then you become self-righteous. Yeah, that's a word that's here that we'll see in the next, next one. A third way would be then to have ill-informed convictions where you just don't maybe know the word enough and you feel guilty about something that really you don't need to feel guilty about. Now, it may be a conviction. You don't want to sear your conscience. But as you understand God's word more and more, you go, oh, okay. I remember talking to a relative one time that said, I'm not going to eat snails because the Old Testament says not to eat snails. Well, that was a part of the Old Covenant when it came to the food and dietary restrictions. There's other ones, too. And I knew that person ate some of those other dietary restrictions like pork and other things like that. But then we see in Acts 10, oh, wait a minute. Jesus appears to Peter and says, you can eat anything. Everything's clean. Now, I don't know why you'd want to eat snails anyway, but you can. It's not a sin to do it. It might just be a little crazy, all right? But that's okay. That's up to you and your freedom, right? So those are some three categories there that, that we could see legalism. And this is one of those where they're taking all of these extra rules that are man-made and dumping them on the backs of those in their care. Heavy burdens. Now, Jesus says this in Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. There, Jesus is addressing the heart. He is thinking of the Pharisees because they looked good on the outside, but he was addressing, you know, things like, oh, you haven't committed murder, right? Oh, yeah, I've never murdered anyone. But in your heart, have you hated someone? Ooh, uh, yeah. Well, then you're a murderer. They didn't like that because they looked good. Well, I'm not a murderer. No, if you hate someone, you are. Well, then Jesus says this, and I'm sure... The crowd was aghast at this statement. In Matthew 5.20, he says, Your righteousness must surpass that of the Pharisees. I don't know if people fainted, but they might have like, Are you kidding? They're like perfect. They're, They're perfect. Look at the outside. They just ooze and glow righteousness. No, the truth was, as Jesus said here, on the inside, dead man's bones. A dirty cup. Oh, the outside looks clean, but inside is dirty. Jesus was addressing the heart because the gospel transforms us from the inside out. John 3, 3, you must be born again. It's your heart that must change. He says the outside of your cup is clean, but the inside is dirty. You want a truly clean cup, it starts with the inside. And that's what Jesus does. He cleans us from our sins because he paid the penalty for our sins. And he offers forgiveness free and clear to those who come to him in faith. Here, instead, they tie up burdens. That was a a term for a bundle that was put on a slave or a pack animal. Thus, they were struggling under the weight of a hugely expanded legal code that enslaved them and did not free them. Paul addressed this in uh, Colossians. Turn to Colossians, if you will, to Colossians chapter 2. This was still going on. We see the book of Galatians uh, addresses these issues, too. Here in Colossians, this is what Paul says in verse 8 to the Colossian church. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. And then he says later in chapter 2, he expands on this in verses 18 through 13. 23, he says, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism, denying yourself of anything that might make might be good and worship of angels going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head. That's Christ. Look down at 20. If with Christ you've died to the elemental spirits of the world, why as if you were still alive in the world do you submit to its regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to these things that all perish as they're used according to human precepts and teachings. These indeed have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Only the gospel can do that. Only Jesus, only having the Holy Spirit in us and his word transforming us can we change and be what we're called to be. That's a gift. Instead, you have these. You can go back to Matthew chapter 23, instead you have these who've heaped on all these extra things. And it says there, and they didn't lift a finger. Hey, here's all these rules. Good luck with that. 
laying that burden on them without even a pinky finger. Well, the gospel lifts the whole thing up with both hands, Jesus' hands. No, they were suffering from Tom Sawyer theology. Tom Sawyer had to paint the fence in that classic work of fiction. And what did he do? He tricked his friends, paying them, paint, he, they paid him to do his job. It was a perfect scenario. If you're Tom Sawyer, in a similar way, that's what you have with these Pharisees. This is why the Reformation was such a big deal, because after 1,500 years of the Christian church, the Christian church began to do what the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes did and begin to add things and heap burdens on people without hope. You could never have assurance because you never knew if you were saved enough because Jesus didn't totally save you. He helped you, but you had to do the rest. So much so, they created this idea of purgatory. It's man-made. It's not in Scripture. And it doesn't make any sense in light of the cross. Purgatory was a place that you could go to. You were, you were kind of good, but not good enough to save yourself. You would go to purgatory, and for a, a certain amount in eternity, you would work off your sins. Then maybe at some point in the way, way, way future, you can end up in heaven. There's no hope in that. There's no gospel in that. That's an evil doctrine made by men because Christ on the cross says, it is finished. Your sins are paid in full. And if you believe in me, they'll be wiped clean. That's the hope of the gospel. That's not the hope of purgatory. Even that, they would charge you and say, pay money for your relatives who've died so that they can skip some levels of purgatory. What a diabolical evil plan to enslave the gospel is good news. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 11. Turn there. A couple pages to your left if you have a, this kind of Bible. In these famous words from Jesus, in light of this, these are the sweet sounds of our Savior helping us understand the truth of the gospel. He says, come to me. Come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's talking about works trying to be good enough. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. I don't squash you. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's the invitation of the gospel, to believe in Jesus. The burden of sin is met with the kindness of the Savior. The burden of legalism was a crushing blow. Let me ask you, what man-made burdens do you bear? We can pick on the Pharisees and the Catholics and other legalists, the Amish. But we have Protestants, we have our version of legalism. I remember growing up and there were certain styles of music you couldn't listen to. Because somehow there was somewhere, I don't know where you figured it out, certain styles were from God and certain styles were not. Southern gospel was somehow endorsed by God, but rock and roll was not. I never found that anywhere in the scriptures that, that helped me understand that. And we can kind of poke fun at that and laugh at that. Or if you played cards, you know, they gamble with cards. So if you play go fish, you, you might go to hell with your, with your cards. I'm not making this kind of stuff up. That was there. Some of you remember that from growing up. Today, it's even worse. Things like social justice are heaped on. Critical race theory. These are gospelist ideas that have infiltrated the church. Cultural mandates. Oh, you're not loving of your neighbor if you don't wear a mask. Who says? Food choices. I, there was a guy that left the church that I was formerly at because we didn't serve fair trade coffee on Sunday mornings. I had to look it up. I didn't even know. We were serving Starbucks and maybe gas Folgers. And somehow he says, you know, you're not caring for my soul if you're not caring for my coffee needs, I guess was what it was. I'm not making that up. That's a true story. Or maybe it's schooling children. Well, we school our children this way and you don't. Oh, you're not as good as us. I can go down the list, right? We come up with our own. Let me ask you, maybe you're trying to make up for your sin. And so you've added a bunch of things to, to burden you with trying to make you feel better about your holiness. Hey, this book is enough. And only Christ can help you as the Spirit indwells in you. It's a light burden and an easy yoke when Christ has your life. That's the hope that we have. Maybe you're imposing your convictions on other people, giving them burdens without a finger of help to them. Sin's weight is released in the power of the gospel. That leads to number three, self-righteousness, showmanship. 
These guys were all about showing off just how great they were. Verses 5, 6, and 7. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. This was their self-righteous showmanship. They were platforming themselves. They were self-promoting themselves. These practices were to win the favor of others, maybe partly to win the favor of God, but really so that others would go, wow, they're amazing. And in that, they have this power. This is what Jesus threatened when he called them out for their sins and these types of shenanigans. He was threatening their power, and they didn't want that kind of a Messiah. So this self-righteous showmanship showed itself in religious attire, places of honor, public greetings, and fancy titles. We'll talk about fancy titles in number four. We'll talk about the other three here, religious attire. They had these things called phylacteries. There are some conservative Jews today who still have these. You might see them. They have leather straps that hold boxes called teflon. And in those boxes contain copies of four biblical passages in Exodus, two from Exodus, two from Deuteronomy, that talk about take the word of God, strap it to your head, strap it to your arms. It was a metaphor, but they've taken it literally. And these guys, in this case, if they had thicker leather phylacteries, you would go, wow, that guy's really holy because his leather is thicker than that other guy. This guy is like a top dog here. Not only that, but the fringes of their tassels were long. In a similar way, those fringes on the tassels, those were on the prayer shawl. These guys really prayed. These guys are so holy. They got the thick phylacteries and these long shawls. Whoa. They were meant to be, in their original state, inward motivators and reminders to call attention to God. But instead, it's a look at me. Look at how holy I am. Just because you got a thick phylactery and long fringes. No, it became a superstitious outward type of thing. That's the religious attire. Places of honor. They had the feast. They were significant. These religious meals, they were part of their, their festivals and feasts. And there would be a U-shaped table. And the most important place was at the junction of the arms of that table, sitting next to the host, the right or the left. Remember that from last week? That's what, that's what James and John's mom wanted, wanted James and John to sit on the right and the left of Jesus for these prominent positions, this table was elevated so that they could see everybody, but more importantly, everybody could see them. Wow, that guy's up there. He's like next to the host. He's super important. High-profile greetings. The marketplace was their, was their stage. That's where everybody was. They were there. That's where they got news. That's where they got edicts from the king or the rulers. It was important to be there. It's where you got your food, your supplies, everything you needed were there. And these guys would show up. Oh, hey, Rabbi so-and-so is here. It was like a rock star sighting or a movie star. Oh, I touched his phylactery when I went by. Oh, I got his autograph on my vase. I don't know what was going on, but these were high-profile greetings, and it was impressive. This was the look-at-me nature of their religiosity, and it was nothing more than self-righteous showmanship. They want to be seen and recognized, and Jesus says, that's not greatness. That's not great. That's not how we do this. Let me ask you, what's your religious attire? What's your place of honor, your marketplace, so to speak? That leads to number four, empty entitlement. Fancy titles. This was the next thing. We talked about entitlement last week. In that case, it was the family card that James and John's mom came to Jesus, most likely his aunt, and was asking, hey, do your cousins a favor, you know, because of this relationship? We get a little special privilege here. Put them on your right and left. That was an entitlement, a thought of entitlement. Here, it's the actual titles. They take good titles, endearing titles, and they ruin them by making them a hierarchy status of title. Like rabbi. Rabbi was an esteemed title. It meant Lord, Master. But it, more importantly, more specifically, an honorary title for an outstanding teacher of the law. Today, we might say Reverend or Doctor, Reverend Doctor, or His Holiness, or His Excellency, or a whole array of other things, too. Now, Jesus was called Rabbi. 
That was out of respect, not status, so to speak. But their use of rabbi was all about being better than others. Oh, I'm the rabbi. It set them off from lesser mortals. God's kingdom has no ranks. He says there, there's one teacher. His name is Jesus. He is the rabbi. Yes, there's other teachers, of course. I'm doing that right now, according to the New Testament. But the better idea there is that he says, brothers and sisters. That's the better designation because it speaks of equality. It speaks of family. That's what we're to be like in this kingdom. Not only that, but don't use father. Now, wait a minute. You're like, does that mean calling my dad father is a sin? No. Again, the context here is they had turned that word into a title of superiority and oppression over the people. It's okay to call your dad father. In fact, Abraham was called the father of all who believe. It was a term of endearment and honor and respect. Paul referred to Timothy and Titus as his sons in the faith. These were endearing relationships, and that's what that's meant for, but that's not what they were using it as. No, the God, the Father, is the one who's canceling all uses of, of Father as a human status symbol. Now, if I could only think of a religion that used the title Father as a status, I'll have to think about that a little further. Maybe you could think about that, too, and see who that might represent. Instructor is another one. That's a personal, private instructor and individualized as a special mentor, resulting in a potentially dangerous loyalty. That happened in the church, in the Corinthian church, right? 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 3. Paul calls them out. You keep kind of lining under your favorite teacher. Oh, I'm of Paul. Oh, I'm of Apollos. Oh, I'm of Cephas, which is Peter. Paul said, have none of that. That's not what it's about. It's not about lining up under your favorite teacher or the one that's meant to you. It doesn't mean you don't have special relations. There's certain pastors and teachers that, that I'm endeared toward because I, I, I've been blessed so much. But here's the truth. Paul says, only God is anything. Jesus should only have that focused kind of loyalty. You have one supreme instructor. It's Jesus. I'm of Jesus. Be of Jesus. So these good titles were hijacked and used for hierarchy, for power. Here's the titles that Jesus gives them in 13. You hypocrite. You want a title? You're a hypocrite. You want another title? It says in verse 19, you blind guide. That was not a compliment. Verse 33 goes for the jugular. You serpents, you brood of vipers. They were demanding that there's a stratus and they were at the top of it. Here's our four symptoms. Here's Jesus' diagnosis then. Here's the symptoms and here's what Jesus says about this. Still in that chapter, verse 13, but woe to you, seven woes here. We're not gonna read them all. I'm gonna highlight a couple of them. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would want to enter to go in. You see, they're not saved. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across land and sea to make a single proselyte a follower. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Whew. Wow. Verses 23 and 24. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tie the mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides straining out a gnat and allowing a camel. And then here Jesus just throws it all down in verse 29. Woe to you scribes and Pharisees for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous saying, oh, well, if we had lived in these days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Jesus says, thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Barakiah. 
whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Whew. I should have told you to take your children out during that. That was, that's intense. This is what Jesus thinks. This is what these symptoms reveal. This is the accusation. Is there a remedy? Yes. There's two verses in between those two sections, the symptoms and the results. Verses 10, excuse me, 11 and 12. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts, exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Wow. Following Jesus is a total contrast. You knew that following Jesus was the remedy, right? You knew that's where we were going, right? I hope so. And here we get this glimpse of the narrow way. Here's what taking up your cross and following him and denying self looks like. You want a title? Servant. That's the one to pursue. The greatest? Servant. Want to be exalted? Surprisingly, humble yourself. It's counterintuitive. This is what the cross-taking life does. It puts us in the path of greatness. Why and how? Well, the daily nature of cross-taking is repellent to self-righteousness. We're reminded every day as we take up our cross, Jesus took up his cross in a unique way to save us. We take up our cross being reminded every day that I need Jesus. I need a Savior. I need help. So true holiness, rather than hollow holiness, is being filled with the Holy Spirit Understanding his word, following his word, being set apart for God's purpose as we lay down our life daily. Lazy legalism is replaced with the pursuit of Christ likeness in our character and our deed. No longer a self righteousness, but as Martin Luther says, a alien righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. He was good enough, he was perfect. And when, when he died for us, our sins went on him if we believe in him. And his righteousness goes on us. And if his righteousness comes on us, it begins to transform us and turn us into the people that God wants us to be. That's taking up your cross daily. Another way, too, the cost of cross-taking weeds out the insincere. You're not going to die for something that you don't believe in or love. You're not going to do it once. You're not going to do it daily. Listen to what John Calvin says about the cross in light of this. He says, by overturning the false ideas which we naturally have about our own powers and by unmasking the hypocrisy which charms and flatters us with its deceits, the cross beats down the arrogance of our flesh which did us untold harm. You see, the cross heals. It heals us. You see, the servant is not an empty title. To be a servant is to be great in God's kingdom. The daily cross reminds us that we are servants of Jesus. And the question then is simply, are you? We find here, if you, if you notice this, that Jesus goes back and forth between pronouns. He says they. He says they about those who are outside in the false religion. He says a you to those who are in. Let me ask you, are you a they? Are you a you? That's the most important aspect of this whole story here, what Jesus is, is saying. They is the path of fake followership as demonstrated by these scribes and Pharisees. The you is those who take up their cross and follow Jesus. So let me ask you, is your holiness hollow? Clean the inside of the cup. Receive the forgiveness that only Jesus can offer as he makes you born again and as you trust in him. Do you suffer from a, a lazy legalism? Heaping burdens on yourself or on others? Or is the Holy Spirit making you more and more like Christ? Is your faith a self-righteous show? You can fool us. You can fool your spouse. You can fool your children, your parents, most likely. But eventually, that smell of death will show itself. Which title do you embrace? Servant is the only title of greatness in Christ's kingdom. So if you have any of these symptoms, there's good news. Jesus saves. Come to him. 
Come to him as his invitation tells us. And if you are saved, keep coming to him. We take up our cross daily. We're coming to him time and time again, being reminded that only he saves and that we are his. And that's true religion. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are so kind in what you offer to us and the goodness that you offer us in Christ. As something as convicting as this is, Lord, we we don't want to fake. We don't want to be hypocrites. We want you to truly transform us and that, yeah, we may stumble and fall. Our testimony will be of one who continues to grow in Christ's likeness. I pray for those who, who need you today. I pray that they would come to you and take your yoke, take your burden on them, which is light and easy because it saves. Give them rest today as they trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey. Thanks for tuning in to our Redeemer YouTube channel. If this is helpful for you, please make sure that you like this video, smash the subscribe button, and hit that bell icon. It will help us reach more people with biblical truth. Thank you so much.